Hi, everyone. This is Tracy Allsport, program coordinator here at Hashtag Sports. We're just going to allow sports. We're just going to allow um, a few more attendees to gather in the room. So excited, so excited for this conversation today. Um, we have a great host, B. Terrell, um, joining us from Made for the W, as well as some of our Creators of Color cohort members. I see Olivia and Jesse on right now. Um, this is going to be such an exciting conversation as we address work-life balance and mental health. Um, I just posted on my Instagram story about how um, burnout in the industry is very real. And so talking to um, our cohort members today, as well as our host, um, we'll be able to hear how you can, you know, address it in ways you can potentially overcome it as well. So, and, you know, address it in, in ways you can potentially overcome it as well. So um, I'll give us maybe about, maybe about one more minute to get all situated, um, please feel free to share share um, today's conversation um, as well as, you know, contribute to it. We're just super excited about it um, once again. So let me... Give a couple more seconds for everybody to get adjusted. And um, just an FYI, I'll tell our speak that FYI, I'll tell our speakers you should have received a request. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll get that to you. Later. Nicole, I think you have some background noise on your side. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today, or excuse me, our host for today, B. Terrell. He is a multimedia journalist and host based in North Carolina. He's a self-proclaimed food critic, enjoys anything savory, of course, and do not forget the ranch. <laughs> Throughout his career, he's had the privilege of covering the NCAA Women's Final Four, the WNBA Finals, the WNBA All-Star Game, Olympics, and more. His work has been featured on May for the W, ESPN, Bleach Report, Soul Collector, and W Slam Magazine. He recently started with ESPN, Bleach Report, Soul Collector, and W Slam Magazine. He recently started with Blue Wire to launch a weekly WNBA past about that, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. So without further ado, um, B. Terrell would love for you to take this um, B. Terrell would love for you to take this conversation over. He's joining us amid, you know, the start of the WNBA season. So off to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, and definitely don't forget the ranch with my wings. Um, but I appreciate the amazing opportunity. Um, I think this is an important discussion, and so I'm excited to go ahead and dive in and get started with everyone because obviously we know there's this battle between mental health and work-life balance. So hopefully today we leave away with some good nuggets for everyone um, to jot down. And I think. Um, the best way to get started, of course, is to go ahead and allow all of our creators to introduce themselves. So I'm not sure how it's showing up on your end, but I'll start here uh, with Olivia, uh, and you can go first, and then we'll go to Jesse and Nicole. Hey there. Thanks for hosting this. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm Olivia. I currently serve as a VP at The Game, which is a sports entertainment and media startup. I currently serve as a VP at The Game, which is a sports entertainment and media startup. And media startup. Before that, I was at The Athletic and then worked in baseball before that. So really excited, really excited to be here um, and, and just learn more than anything. I feel like that's uh, what I'm most excited about today. So really great panel and thanks for hosting. Hi, guys. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining and, and stuff. Um, my name is Jesse. I'm the art director for USC Athletics, um, kind of overseeing all of our graphics and our design team here and um, kind of overseeing um, our brand and, and stuff. Um, that's me. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole. I'm the lead sports producer at Snapchat. Uh, again, super excited to just be a part of this conversation. Um, I've become a new mom since the pandemic, so I definitely have a lot that I've learned in the past year. So again, excited to just connect with you all and just discuss the importance of mental health this month. Thank you all. Thank you all. And for everyone listening, make sure you go and follow the speakers. Um, and I think the best way we're going to go ahead and get started with this. Thank you all once again for the introductions. And we know that May represents May Health, excuse me, Mental Health Awareness Month. And I guess to go ahead and start, I want each of you to 
help us understand what mental health and awareness and a that whole topic and that discussion, what does that mean to you all? And what does that look like with creating awareness of mental health? Sure, I'm happy to go first. I think um, it's actually funny because I was preparing for this today and really thinking through what I wanted to say at a, at a time where I honestly feel like I have not been the best at prioritizing my time or um, feeling like a little overwhelmed with things. So, you know, that imposter syndrome kind of kick, starts to kick in and things like that. But for me, um, mental health is just so important and something that I didn't prioritize early in my career. And a lot of that um, mental health and feeling uh, well mentally is coming f from like a work life balance for me. So just figuring out like how much I can give at certain times and when I need to scale back. So it's definitely a work in progress for me. And I think um, what it currently means to me right now is just something that I really, really need to prioritize and have the, the luxury of being able to prioritize at my job. Um, so uh, it's definitely, I guess, if I could define it in any way, it's just uh, a work in progress for me and something that I, I know is extremely valuable. And uh, without focusing on that, really at all times, I feel like I'm just not effective at, as an employee, as a person and relationships, things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And Nicole? Yeah, I'm just going to add, and it's funny, I can connect this back to a pediatrician appointment I just left with my son, and he said the key is it's not so much what you eat, it's what you absorb, and that really stuck with me because what you think can change how you view yourself, how you view people around you, and truly just how your life goes from there, and I realized the importance. And Nicole? Yeah, I was just going to add, and it's funny, I can connect this back to a pediatrician appointment I just left with my son, and he said the key is it's not so much what you eat, it's what you absorb. And that really stuck with me because what you think can change how you view yourself, how you view people around you, and truly just how your life truly just how your, your life goes from there. And I realized the importance of prioritizing self-care and just what you're allowing to come into your to your body, whether it's visuals, what you hear, because that's what you're going to reflect when you speak to others. And so as a new mom, again, like I've just realized just how much it's important for me to take care of my mentals. I, I love that phrase from um, Arshan. So I would love to, again, have this conversation with you all to see how you guys are doing that, as well as some ways that I'm trying to get better in that space, too. Thank you. Yes. And by all means, we have to pr protect the mental. And uh, Jesse, how about you? Yeah, I think, you know, mental health is, is something that is being talked about more and definitely super, super important. Um, kind of like Nicole, I'm a relatively new dad. Um, and I think that to me just adds an entire new, entirely new layer on, you know, how important that is, especially as a dad trying to raise two kids um, in kind of like this social media world. And, um, and yeah, it's just, you know, bring that awareness, not only for me and, and uh, my family and um, at work and um, just raising the level of importance um, is something I'm, I'm pet out. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me. So I think for now, I'll go ahead and add a little piece of uh, put in there. Um, the pandemic, it, it definitely taught me, you know, uh, I think similar to what you said, Nicole, protecting my peace, protecting my space, understanding my boundaries, um, allowing others to, uh, well, articulating my boundaries with everyone else. And so I think that's so important because so many times we, we want to work, we want to work, we want to meet these deadlines. And at sometimes it's just like, okay, I got to take a chill pill a little bit and take care of me first because I can't do anything if I'm not here. And so I'll go to you, Jesse. Uh, the stigma around mental health, it's gradually declining, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So especially when it comes to men and the treatment of our mental health, or at least the acknowledgement of our mental health, can you talk about how that stigma impacts men and how have you or be some others um, in your circle can be advocates for other men to understand the importance of taking care of mental health? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as guys, a lot of us were raised with the idea that men, you know, are supposed to be, um, you know, like really tough and strong or, you know, showing emotions is like a sign of weakness. You know, um, there's, you know, the phrase like boys don't cry or men don't cry was used a lot, I think, in a lot of, um, with a lot of my friends and, and stuff. And now that we're adults, it's kind of, you know, shows back up again as, um, 
you know, like unresolved trauma or anxiety and depression or, you know, men being stunted emotionally um, and not really being able to, you know, have the full um, human, human experience as, you know, just feeling, you know, all of your emotions deeply. Um, and I think um, even though the stigma is, um, you know, getting better, there's still like a huge stigma around therapy and even just seeking help um, about it. And I think, you know, DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love, when they spoke up, it really opened the door for people and for men especially to be um, open and vulnerable with what they're going through mentally. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think it's just their example of just how open they were as, you know, these big NBA superstars, like just saying, you know, like we're human and we feel things deeply. We, you know, have sad emotions too. I think, um, yeah, that really opened the door for a lot of men, especially to be like, yes, like I feel that too, you know, I need help, you know, to vocalize um, kind of their emotions and, and things like that and uh, just be more open about it. Um, and so I think, you know, for me personally, a big thing is, you know, as a dad, um, one of the things my wife and I are trying to do with my son is, you know, if he's sad, we say, you know, it's okay to cry if you're sad. Or if he, you know, is feeling a big emotion, we try to help him kind of talk through what he's feeling, kind of verbals, um, what's going through his head, and kind of name emotions um, at a young age, so that um, as he grows up, he's able to kind of deal um, kind of with his feelings in a more healthy way than um, a lot of us do uh, right now, I think, especially, you know, myself. Um, and so, yeah, I think as men in general, I think um, if if we want to kind of continue to make progress around mental health and, you know, um, growing awareness and kind of dealing, dealing with that issue, I think it's up to us to kind of set an example um, to, to the younger generation to, to just be more open to, you know, say things like, I love you, or, you know, I'm proud of you, or, you know, um, just be open with, you know, what we're going through and, and um, just being open to kind of those conversations and, and things like that. That's very important. Um, something I always remind myself is to just allow myself to be vulnerable and accept and appreciate the most. And so that's, uh, that's well said, Jesse, appreciate that. And um, <clears throat> Nicole, you're in charge of running all things sports related at SNAP. So how would you describe your average day on the job and what keeps you going, especially with, you know, making sure that you're putting yourself first in terms of protecting your mental health and that and keeping that balance? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I have to admit, I'm, it's not just me on the sports team. I have a manager and the two of us together also work with a few other people, but it's no easy feat at all. There's hundreds of partners on our Snapchat Discover page. And so my day-to-day -day usually consists of reviewing new pitches from sports partners or providing editorial feedback to help them optimize their shows for our Discover page. And it's a lot of fun because I'm a people person, so I have the opportunity to talk with a lot of people. But as I realized in the pandemic world, a lot of those calls means a lot of virtual calls. It means you're on video and I have natural hair and it's not always feeling its best at times. So it's definitely a struggle for me um, to always feel like I have to be on and to obviously represent myself and the company in the best way I can. So over time, I've come to learn, and even my son vibes with what I'm saying, but over time, I've come to learn just the importance of giving myself grace and taking the time to have my camera off for calls that aren't a priority or to block off true hours of time where I mark myself as busy just to give me time where I can close my laptop. That's been a huge benefit for me to manage the balance of the workload that I have and also my own self-care of not feeling like I have to be on 24 hours of the day. Okay, come on, getting self-grace. I like that. And um, I just want to say, so it's you who... who probes the content that I see on my snap. I love the stories and I love what you all do there. And I guess this one is a two-parter. How do you take a break from those moments throughout the day for yourself? And you, you mentioned giving yourself grace. And then on the flip side, has there ever been a period where you've just experienced burnout? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's been really hard for me during this time is that working remotely so for the past two years, I've worked at home. And as I've stated before, I became a new mom. So the hardest part for me is separating work from my personal life. 
like a matter of a room is not really the biggest divide between, okay, I have to care for my son, but I also have to attend to this partner on a call. So it's definitely been really, um, it's been complicated at times. And I think the thing I'm learning is that even though things aren't easy, doesn't mean I still can't find a place of contentment. And I've realized in order to find that, there's just certain times where I had to take for myself. And I realized in the business world, like the whole phrase of it's not personal, it's just business. I realized like that can mean how I view the business as well. So if they want the best of me, the best of me cannot do these, set these bars that I have for myself at times where I feel like I have to be on camera every call or I have to, you know, um, sometimes on calls where I'm just more of a listener, I realize that's an opportunity for me to actually knock out a few quick tasks. And it's finding those those moments where I can find that balance that gives me more peace to be that employee they want me to be, but also feel like personally, I'm still protecting my own space and how I can go about my day. So there's times where I block off again, like an hour of time, even though I don't necessarily have to, but just to give me a moment to take a breath so I can try to find some balance between working remotely and still obviously being a mom in the house too. I love that balance is definitely key. Balance is, once again, definitely key. So uh, thank you for that, Nicole. <clears throat> and uh, this one will be for you, Olivia. Uh, you recently took over as a new VP of social content at Game Day. And not only that, you're also finishing up your MBA at Johns Hopkins. So your schedule is really hectic, I can, I can imagine. And you're managing a personal newsletter. Where do you find the time? And how do you maintain that balance? Yeah, well, first of all, I wish I was finishing up my MBA. I still have a little bit to go. So uh, light's not quite at the end of the tunnel yet. But yeah, so I think for me from a, a tactic standpoint, and again, like a, a definitely a different scenario than Jesse or Nicole and that I am mainly responsible for myself. Um, but from a tactical standpoint, it really comes from just planning. So people ask me this question before about balance. And I this is always my number one suggestion. And it's just plan ahead of time. So I try my best to set aside time on Sunday to plan for my week. And I try to plan my next day the night before. Um, without that, I feel like once the day gets started, as everybody knows, you get pulled into meetings and a bunch of different directions. And it's just so easy to, to get behind by then. So I really try to ensure that I'm uh, planning my schedule out. And then what Nicole said, which has been really big for me too, is just locking out times of my day so I can... Uh, focus on myself, focus on times where I can sit down and think versus just do all the time. I feel um, like that's when I'm the most creative and the most effective. So that's also been a really big thing for me. And as, as everybody knows, um, like things will go wrong or things will not go according to plan throughout your day. So uh, what I've really tried to do is make sure that I have enough time built in so that like when these things happen, not everything collapses. I know what that feels like when just like one little thing is the breaking point. So just making sure that um, I do give myself time for those things to happen because they're just inevitable. And then um, for me too, it's just prioritizing myself in different spaces. I feel a lot more effective as a person when I prioritize working out. And even if that's just going for a walk to clear my mind, um, that has been a huge part of me being able to maintain balance as well as taking care of other aspects of my health uh, in addition to mental health because without that I, I definitely feel like I get a lot more burnt out or tired more easily okay thank you uh Jesse um to come back to you had a little bit of time over there and so as the art director at USC you're in charge of producing content around its athletes and making sure that they're shown in the best light how do you ensure that that balance is there in your personal life in order for you to show up as your best self in order to do your job and how does that also affect your work? Yeah, I think, you know, definitely the first thing would be um, actively trying to avoid burnout um, and like creative burnout. Um, and that could look like many things for different people. Um, so for me, I think it starts with kind of defining where I put my identity and where I find value. Um, and then just uh, setting, you know, priorities of, you know, what's important to me. And then from there, kind of like what Olivia said, is just um, just planning out your time accordingly, um, planning ahead, um, and just being able to uh, kind of set boundaries between, um, you know, work and, and your personal life as much as possible. Uh, so for me, when I, after I pick up my son from daycare and go home, I won't touch my computer or anything 
um, until they're asleep. And so um, I think for me, um, that kind of is one thing that I do to kind of get that separation a little bit um, and just be able to spend time with my kids and uh, my wife and, and um, just be present, I think. Um, and then another thing is just, you know, um, taking care um, of, of myself physically, I think, you know, like working out, trying to take as many naps as I can on the weekends, you know, trying to sleep regular hours and, and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, I think doing things like uh, prioritizing where you put your time and, and stuff really helps um, kind of avoid burnout. And I find that that um, just really helps me perform, I guess, better at work and, and um, just show up as, as a, you know, my full, my full self. Okay. Now, are you always successful not being able to, or not, or trying, I should say, not to touch your computer before, you know, having that family time? Or how do you pivot from that if there may have to be some sort of adjustment in your schedule? Um, I want to say I'm 100% successful, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> um, I think working in sports, you have to have, you know, understanding spouse and, um, credit to her for, for, for uh, to my wife for being that. Um, yeah, I think um, I try to plan out my time and my day as much as possible um, so that when I do get home, there is that kind of um, downtime or break in, in the work schedule to, to, um, to have that family time. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, still work in progress. Hey, honestly, we love that. <laughs> we love that. Uh, thank you, Jesse. So this one is for you, Nicole. Uh, mental Health America, they recently conducted a, uh, excuse me, conducted mental health screenings to better understand the unmet needs and gaps in care amongst specific populations, especially youth, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So can you talk about what those barriers might be for people of color from seeking mental health services? And how can we, you know, for lack of better words, break those down? Yeah, so... Um... For just from my personal story, like one of the things I've seen in the black community at times is just that unfortunate stigma around mental health services. So like, I think Jesse, you kind of touched on this before, like even a man seeking out mental health support, it's just somehow when you seek that, that, that support you're seen as weak or it's kind of embarrassing to talk about with other people. Um, and I see that stigma, unfortunately, in the black community at times where it's more of like, we're taught from like a young age to have tough skin to you know, take on the world based on what's happened to us. And so when we have times where we feel feel vulnerable or weak, that's not usually a positive perspective people have on us. And then on the other side, sometimes there's people who just don't trust people in the medical field for a lot of reasons. And I think that holds back a lot of people from getting the help they need. And I think one other reason, and I've seen this as well is is in my community too, is people just say, pray about it. Like there's like that religious factor. And they push that as the only way to get, you know, some kind of peace or solace from whatever you're dealing with. And I just think it's important for people to have a space where they can be dysfunctional. Because as a human, like, you don't have everything all together at the time. And I think it's important to have either a person or a place where you can be at peace with just not having it all together and having someone to talk it out. And I do think for that reason that we should definitely be more, you know, open arms to people who want to get help and, and actually support and encourage people to do that when they when they come to you as far as expressing an issue and so ways to break that down is exactly what we're doing today it's having these public conversations where people hear that they're not alone that other people i have a lot of friends who are me and i actually find that quite inspiring because they're trying to find ways to get help so i think the more we have these open conversations and people become aware about how people are struggling but also seeking help that hopefully it starts to just reduce that stigma and people go out and get the help they need. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, these conversations are very important because you never know just by having a conversation, talking about therapy, it helps break down those stigmas. And I know obviously when I started with my journey to uh, obtaining a therapy, it was based off of a simple discussion with my inner circle. And so it's, it's very important. And, um, this one, uh, will be for you, Olivia, in your role, you're supporting and leading team members, Can you share with us some ways that you encourage employees to take care of their mental health and how can other managers ensure they're not only focused on their own health, but the well-being of their employees? 
Yeah, so I have the luxury of actually, uh, or I guess a downside, depending on the way you look at it, of being in an office again. So I work hybrid, so I am able to see my employees face to face. And I do think that there is definitely something to be said about that, um, because it's a little bit easier to see when they might be having a bad day or they're feeling burnt out or things like that. So um, before that, I did manage a team remotely as well. Um, so it's it comes with more challenges, I would think, when it comes uh, to observing how people are feeling and behaving, but definitely not impossible. But uh, with that said, I, I think it's really important that we just ask, like check in in your weekly one-on-ones or whatever your meetings look like and see how people are doing. In addition to asking about output, what they're working on, um, progress on certain things, just make sure you get a gut check on how they're feeling as well. Um, for me, I, I think that comes in the form of telling people to take the time off or the afternoon off if they're looking tired um, to emphasize the importance of rest and and to also emphasize at the end of the day, like I have worked in sports my whole career. I love it. Um, and our work isn't not important. It's extremely valuable and offers a lot to our communities, but it's not the end all be all. And I think it's so important we get sort of stuck in our lanes um, uh, when working on something with our heads down. So that's been really important for me to emphasize as well. It's like this work will get done, um, but you know, we're a lot uh, less uh, replaceable and things like that as humans sort of make sure that we're prioritizing uh, rest and not getting burnt out. Um, another example for me is I think that we as managers and leaders need to lead by example. So when I was first starting my career and managing people, I felt like I always needed to be present uh, in the room. And if I wasn't feeling well, I would show up. Obviously, this is before the pandemic. But if I if I was tired, I would show up and things like that. And I used to think that it was like a good way of showing that I was invested into the company and, and into my team. But that's really been a shift for me lately. So if I'm feeling sick, or if I'm feeling burnt out, I do think that the best way that I can show and lead my team um, is to take the time off that I need because if I'm uh, if I'm a leader for them and I'm not prioritizing my own mental health and my own well-being, how can I ask them to or expect them to or know how to? Um, so that's been really uh, a really big eye-opening piece of advice uh, that I tried to take to heart for myself over uh, the last year or so. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, for Jesse and Nicole, uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier, obviously, with the both of you being active parents, but to add on to you both represent very notable organizations. So with fulfilling the duties of your jobs, have you ever really had an opportunity or have you experienced your, I guess, your balance being challenged with, okay, I have this assignment, but I also have mommy or daddy assignment. So what does that look like with you when you may have to make some necessary decisions or changes to take care of both work and home? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, um, I'll go first here. And Jesse, I really loved what you said about how when you pick up your, your child from daycare, like you kind of dedicate that time to family time. I try to do the same thing when I close my laptop. So I love that. And I think that's definitely helped me. But also, at least at SNAP, I've been very um, thankful for the resources that they offer to families and to specifically mental health. Like they have even counsel sessions, which is something I learned about at this company where it's truly a time where it's not so much work related, but it's more so to just discuss your day, kind of unwind a bit. And I have found that quite um, therapeutic for me. And so honestly, I think just with that framework um, in the relationship I have with my manager, it's truly just just embracing the fact that we're all humans and especially in this remote world. Hey, at times I can't make that call and I'm just, I have to be more vocal about that because he obviously can't read my minds or see how I'm doing that day. And I think being vocal about the times where I need to pull back has been very life-changing for me because now they're aware and they're not so much questioning work ethic, but they truly see like, hey, there's more on your plate now, obviously, raising a child. And I think embracing that human element has what's really made a difference is how I have my work and having a manager who definitely has that as well has been huge for me too. Thank you, Nicole. How about for you, Jesse? Yeah, I think, you know, um, <clears throat> working as, as a designer in sports in general, I think is very, um, you know, time consuming as a job. Um, there's a lot of, you know, off hours and um, especially working in college athletics where, you know, you're kind of overseeing multiple teams at once. Um, it can get really, um, really hard trying to balance 
um, you know, being a social person or, you know, having, you know, a family uh, with work and, and stuff like that. And um, I think here at USC, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of coworkers who are also parents um, who kind of understand um, the time um, commitment it takes to be a good dad or, you know, be a good mom or be a present um, spouse at home. And so, yes, even though um, there's so much to do um, for all 21 of our sports here, um, I think that there's kind of like um, like an unspoken kind of thing where um, people know um, when I go home, they're not going to hear from me until, you know, a certain time at night or um, that they know um, kind of how I prioritize my time, um, putting my family first type of thing. Um, and then, you know, something I've been trying to do more of over the past few years is um, delegating. Um, I think that there's oftentimes where there's projects that I really want to do that are just so, um, you know, time consuming, um, that take a lot of creative energy that I just don't you know, have for any more with two kids. Um, and I think um, after getting one kid, it was kind of like, okay, I think I can still do this type of thing. Um, but then after getting a second kid, it's just like, I don't have time to, to do this. And so I think something I've been working on is just delegating more. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it's been good just um, being able to spend more time with my kids and make more time uh, to be with my family. Um, but then also on the other side, giving opportunities to uh, my designers to, to you know, flex their creative muscles more and, and grow in that way too. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of something I've been trying to work on. Thank you. Amazing tip. So this one is going to be for everyone. Um, I obviously work in sports in some capacity, and it's known for having long days, action-packed days, fun days, but never the, nonetheless, they're long days. So what advice would each of you, and we can start with you, Nicole, would you give job seekers looking to, I guess, foray into the sports industry? Uh, honestly, it's be prepared, just, you know, for a very unique schedule. I remember when I was an entry-level employee, I started out at ESPN, and as an entry-level employee, I definitely got a bit of those grunt hours, so I worked a graveyard shift to cut highlights for Sports Center. And I remember on holidays, that's often where there's a lot of sporting events. So I wasn't able to travel home. So there's a lot of that that comes with the role. And that definitely wasn't a negative. It was just something to embrace because I wanted to do well at my job. I wanted to be the person that traveled to those events. So for that reason, that just comes with the role. And I think it's just being aware of the reality of just the work-life yeah. balance that comes with sporting positions and, oh, um, yeah. and having fun with it and doing your best. And I think definitely now that I'm older, I see times where I should have taken more vacation. I should have taken more lunch breaks to truly give myself more peace of mind at the job to prevent burnout, especially when I was starting out as entry-level employee. So I would definitely just, you know, embrace the reality of it, but also still know you can protect your mental health. That does not mean you at all have to work yourself ragged just because you are starting out with an entry-level job. Use those PTO days, certainly. And how about for you, Olivia? Yeah, I think a piece of advice is try to find out um, as much information as you can about your boss and about the company it, itself before you start. I think, um, you know, it's really easy to th know what you know about you from being a consumer, but any insight that you can get, I think would be really valuable because it is going to be a huge part of your life. And like you said, it's crazy hours and things like that. So um, the more you can find out about the your your department, the business, I think will be really helpful because you don't want to be in a place where even though you might love the the product or the team or whatever it is as a consumer, um, when you get to the inside, it, it's not a place that um, prioritizes you or gives you these resources that you need. So um, if I had one piece of advice, it would be that. Okay. And Jesse? I would say um, if you're trying to get a job in, in sports, I think one big thing with, that was helpful for me is um, just networking and kind of um, meeting, whether it's through like Twitter or, you know, email or Zoom or, or whatever, just talking with people in the industry. And, and um, what I found was that especially for, you know, content creators in, in the sports industry, it's a very um, small, tight-knit community. Um, and so I think 
uh, that's something I would I would suggest. Okay, and just one other question for you all before we get this to Tracy. How does what are some best practices I should say that you'll share with anyone in regards to how their organization could prioritize mental health? And we'll start with you, Jesse. Um, I think uh, I would say just be vocal um, and kind of uh, if you're you know in a managerial role, um, kind of set the tone. Um, I think um, something that my family went through last year. Uh, so um, our daughter was born um, last May, uh, so she's almost one, but she was born a uh, trimester early. Um, and so for me and my family, that was um, really scary just um, being in the NICU for 70 days and going through the highs and lows of, of just, um, you know, getting her off supplemental oxygen, getting her box open, and then, you know, um, having the fear of like, okay, like, is she going to make it out of here? You know, is she going to be able to meet your brother or her brother um, or her grandparents? Um, and like, even initially, like, when we'll be able to even like touch her or hold her and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that was a very trying time for our family. Um, but um, during that time, you know, my coworkers and um, everyone here at USC kind of um, played a big role in in, um, in showing up. Uh, so we had, you know, some of my coworkers delivering us meals and, you know, coaches and um, uh, stuff like that, just, you know, texting me to like see how I was doing and even, you know, our athletic director, uh, Mike Bone, he, um, you know, shot me a message saying he was like thinking about our family and, and, and stuff like that. And so I think, um, you know, it starts at the top, uh, just setting um, a tone of, you know, what kind of workplace and what kind of work environment you want to have. Um, and, you know, for me and my team, that's kind of um, when I said as well, uh, just really, um, you know, promoting, you know, mental health awareness and um, kind of like what Olivia said before, just advocating for people to, you know, take off when they need to take off, you know, taking time um, for themselves if they need it and, and, and stuff like that. And first of all, I just want to say definitely glad that you had a support system there uh, during those times and happy early birthday to your daughter. And Olivia? Sure. I mean, Jesse really hit the nail on the head here. Everything he said was spot on. So I won't, I won't uh, you know, go through that again. But I do think uh, another thing is effectively managing up. Um, like Jesse said, it, it does start at the top of how organizations are viewing mental health and work-life balance. So if you're in a position where you're managing others, um, make sure that you're advocating for them at all levels and uh, make sure that you're holding the people above you, um, you know, to the standard as well that you're setting for your team so that once well they can prioritize uh, their team's well-being as well and to see uh, an organizational change or organizational prioritization of those sort of things, it does start at the top. So sort of just echoing everything that Jesse said. And Nicole? Yeah, Jesse and Olivia definitely broke it down. And Okay, and just one other question, question for you all before we get this to Tracy. How does, what are some best practices, I should say, that you'll share with anyone in regards to how their organization could prioritize mental health? And we'll start with you, Jesse. Um, I think uh, I would say just be vocal um, and kind of, uh, if you're, you know, in a managerial role, um, kind of set the tone. Um, I think um, something that my family went through last year. Uh, so um, our daughter was born um, last May. Uh, so she's almost one, but she was born a uh, trimester early. Um, and so for me and my family, that was um, really scary just um, being in the NICU for 70 days and going through the highs and lows of, of just, um, you know, getting her off supplemental oxygen, getting her box open, and then, you know, um, having the fear of like, okay, like, is she going to make it out of here? You know, is she going to be able to meet your brother or her brother um, or her grandparents? Um, and like, even initially, like, when we'll be able to even like touch her or hold her and stuff like that. 
Um, and so I think that was a very trying time for our family. Um, but um, during that time, you know, my coworkers and um, everyone here at USC kind of um, played a big role in, in, um, in showing up. Uh, so we had, you know, some of my coworkers delivering us meals and, you know, coaches and um, uh, stuff like that, just, you know, texting me to like see how I was doing and even, you know, our athletic director, uh, Mike Bone, he is delivering us meals and, you know, co- coaches and um, uh, stuff like that, just, you know, texting me to like see how I was doing and even, you know, our athletic director, uh, Mike Bone, he, um, you know, shot me a message saying he was like thinking about our family and, and, and stuff like that. And so I think, um, you know, it starts at the top, uh, just setting um, a tone of, you know, what kind of workplace and what kind of work environment you want to have. Um, and, you know, for me and my team, that's kind of um, when I said, um, and, you know, for me and my team, that's kind of um, when I said as well, uh, just really, uh, just really, um, you know, promoting, you know, mental health awareness and um, kind of like what Olivia said before, just advocating for people to, you know, take off when they need to take off, you know, taking time um, for themselves if they need it and, and, and stuff like that. And first of all, I just want to say definitely glad that you had a support system there uh, during those times and happy early birthday to your daughter. And Olivia? Sure. I mean, Jesse really hit the nail on the head here. Everything he said was spot on. So I won't, uh, you know, go through that again. But I do think uh, another thing is effectively managing up. Um, like Jesse said, it, it does start at the top of how organizations are viewing mental health and work life balance. So if you're in a position where you're managing others, um, make sure that you're advocating for them at all levels and uh, make sure that you're holding the people above you, um, you know, to the standard as well that you're setting for your team so that once well they can prioritize uh, their team's well-being as well and to see uh, an organizational change or organizational prioritization of those sort of things, it does start at the top. So sort of just echoing everything that Jesse said. And Nicole? Yeah, Jesse and Olivia definitely broke it down. And I think the last thing I would just add is just this journey in general, like uh, providing mental health resources to employees and just even working on your own mental health. I just think it's definitely also important to know that it's not something that I think will be fixed or resolved, even in a matter of a day, weeks, or even a year. Like it's an ongoing journey. And I think I would just love to see more people be fully dedicated to that work, knowing that it's more than just you know, doing something in May for May for Mental Health Awareness Month. It's truly just constantly being an advocate, constantly being vocal, constantly creating the spaces for people to be human that I think will really lead to change. Um, and I would love to just see more companies take on that mission to do that and knowing that it's going to take some time. So basically to sum it up, as you all have said, it's being an advocate in every sense of the word. Absolutely. All right, thank you all for an amazing evening. Good afternoon. Uh, Tracy, we'll come over to you and let you take it from here. Yes, absolutely. Um, Gems were dropped today, so I really appreciate um, you, B. Terrell, as the moderator for this, leading this conversation and and answering those, um, you know, much needed questions, as well as all of our speakers for being so open and candid on their experiences in their roles. Um, I'll also encourage, once again, to follow all of the individuals today. They're very active on their socials um, and kind of just active voices in the industry. Um, and just to point out something that I feel like was a reoccurring theme in this this episode was just be articulate. Um, Bitro, you mentioned that early on in the episode, um, and I feel like everybody shared those sentiments. Be articulate with your needs um, in regards to mental health, in regards to work, all of it. Um, people cannot provide help unless you voice that. So. Um, at this time, we'll open up the floor um, for anybody who has anything to add to the conversation or if anybody has any questions for our panelists today, um, just request and our, um, and I feel like everybody share those sentiments, be articulate with your needs um, in regards to mental health, in regards to work, all of it. Um, people cannot provide help unless you voice that. So um, at this time, we'll open up the floor. Um, we'll open up the floor um, for anybody who has anything to add to add to the conversation, or if anybody has any questions for our panelists today. Um, just request, and our 
tech team behind the hashtag sports page will will bring you up um on stage if you have any um thing to add to today's conversations if not we'll we'll wrap this up here soon Okay, I don't think anyone has anything to add. I am gonna add, I am gonna do a quick plug as we are planning for our hashtag sports festival here in Las Vegas, um, July twelfth through the fourteenth. It'll be hosted at the Cosmo be hosted at the Cosmopolitan. Um, there is a promo that is gonna end this Friday. So if any of you all interested in being interested in being a part of the hashtag sports um, festival where we celebrate fan engagement, creativity, and impact to all things um, sports. Uh, please take advantage of that. Um, it gets you $200 off the conference pass. Um, and we would just all hope to for you all to join us out there. It was mentioned that some of us are still working remote. So also a great opportunity to come back in working remote. So also, also a great opportunity to come back in and kind of convene in, per in person if you're comfortable. Um, with that being said, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day afternoon, Wednesday afternoon. Make sure to tune, tune into the WNBA um, season coming up. And um, um Everyone have a great rest of their day. Thank, Thank you, you all again. Enjoy again. Enjoy your Thank day. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.